welcome everyone. Uh, welcome everyone here in Lender and, and to those on Zoom. Uh, welcome to 721 uh, University <coughs> Avenue and welcome to Whitman Day. So, uh, so let me begin with the, the university's uh, land acknowledgement. I acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. So today is the day that we celebrate and honor our extraordinary benefactor and supporter, Marty Whitman. We are very fortunate to have our school associated with someone as special as Marty. He was not only very successful as an investor, but he was also a very caring man. Along with his wife, Lois, they have had, well, they had and, and still have many philanthropic interests and causes that they cared about. And one of those, of course, was Whitman. And among the many things that Marty loved about Whitman, and remember, Marty was an intrinsic value investor. And so he invested in us because of the intrinsic value that he saw in our community. Among the many things that Marty loved about Whitman was our commitment to being relevant and to connecting with practice. It's, tr it's tradition that dates back to the founding of the school when Whitman was one of the first business schools in the country and one of the first to require an internship before graduation. So one way we recognize that tradition of connecting theory and practice on Whitman Day is to host a guest speaker who can bring the world of business to all of us here on campus. And today's guest speaker is a great example of that and also one of our own. So Dan Folkman is a 2012 Finance and Triple E graduate of Whitman. He's currently SVP of Business, which sounds like it's pretty much SV, SVP of everything, Dan, at GoPuff, a consumer tech company that delivers everyday essentials, from cleaning supplies to home needs to over-the-counter medications to food and drinks in just minutes. And in his role, he oversees business development, corporate development, marketing communications at GoPuff ads. During the six years with the, with, with the company, Dan has led their fundraising in M&A and helped raise more than $4 billion in pursuit of GoPuff's ambitious plans. I'm delighted that he's made time to be here with us today to share some of his experience and thoughts with us. So please join me in welcoming Dan Folkman. Thanks, Gene. So first, it's great to be back on campus. I haven't been back here, I think I was telling Allison this last night, in maybe five years. Um, so it looks a little bit different, masks and different buildings. I found out today that uh, Archibald has gotten some pretty big improvements, which is happy for me to hear because I used to be afraid that working out every day I'd get tetanus. Um, so I'm gonna have to check that out after this. Uh, but no, I'm, look, first I'm humbled to be here. Uh, when Allison called me and invited me to speak uh, on Whitman Day as a keynote, I was surprised. I was very humbled. Uh, and it was even more surprising to learn that I was the first uh, keynote that they asked to come speak that didn't come from the world of finance. Right? So I thought that was pretty cool. I couldn't cut it in finance. Uh, I studied finance, and the dean uh, kindly reminded me that that was one of my majors, but entrepreneurship was really what I focused on. Finance was a little bit over my head. I was joking last night with the dean that I don't think I've yet to, to run a net present value model on any of the acquisitions that we've run. Um, and so, but, but seriously, when, when Allison asked me to come speak, I started thinking, what, what could I possibly say uh, to you guys that would be valuable, right? When you think about some of the speakers that had come over the last handful of years, or really decades, in honor of, of uh, Mr. Whitman. Um, and I thought about all the failures that I've gone through. I thought about all the untraditional things that I've experienced. Uh, in fact, one of the ironic things about me speaking here with you guys today is I actually almost didn't get into Syracuse. I almost didn't go to college. Uh, when I was in high school, I wasn't a great student. When I was in college, I wasn't a great student. Uh, and my mom is probably the only reason that I actually ended up in school. So the funny story is that I didn't want to go to school. I wanted to go play hockey. I wanted to go play junior hockey. That was all I cared about. That was all I thought about. And if, honestly, if I wasn't naturally a little bit intelligent, I probably would have failed out of high school. Uh, so my mom, she applied to more than a dozen colleges on my behalf, I swear to God. Uh, 
I did the SATs, I did that myself. Um, but the rest of it was my mom. And I got rejected from almost every school. Rutgers, Delaware, Penn State, you name it. Every school that would, you would, anyone would apply to in the same breath as Syracuse rejected me. And Syracuse almost rejected me. I, got in, I was on the wait list. And so when I got off the wait list, uh, it was like May. So it was pretty late. I had never been to Syracuse. I had never visited. Uh, and you guys can imagine the tears that came from my mom's eyes when we got there the voicemail that I had gotten in off the wait list. She didn't think I was going to go to college either. Um, and the World War III that ensued in my household when I said I didn't want to go. Uh, but after a lot of convincing, my mom convinced me to come to Syracuse. And, you know, I thought today coming back and, and speaking that the thing that I could probably provide that was the most valuable was the lessons that I've learned on the very untraditional path that I've taken over the last 12 years, which is crazy to say going from someone who barely got into Syracuse to someone who's helping to run a $15 billion company. And so one of the concepts that I've tried to embrace over the last handful of years is this idea of learning while leading. Uh, you know, I'm 32. When I started at, at GoPuff, I was 25. Uh, our founders were 22. Um, and GoPuff was this quintessential startup. It was in Philadelphia. We, when I joined, there was like 10 to 15 people we had, we were operating in a handful of cities. Uh, we had raised our first round of funding. It was like eight million bucks. That was, by the way, a series A of $8 million at that time was a big deal. <laughs> Today, you know, that's like a pre, pre, pre seed, I think they call it, um, which is kind of bizarre. But anyway, so we were still working in the warehouse. Like our office was attached to our warehouse. Uh, we had a couple employees. Everyone was doing everything. It was 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was like totally, encapsulating the energy and, and the scrappiness and, and you know everything that we were doing and the reality of what it is and I think what was super interesting for me is that like we had no idea what we were doing <laughs> you had first-time founders no one in the company was over the age of 25 or 20. I was I was the gray hair at 25 years old right um, and we were figuring it out and, and ultimately we realized at that age that our biggest advantage was the fact that we had no experience and so we leaned into the naivete that, that we had at the time, and we were truly learning while we were leading the company. Now, that was easier to do when you had 10 to 15 employees. All of a sudden, we blinked twice and we had 15,000, you know, across four countries, 1,500 cities, 700 buildings, millions of customers, and media, you know, paying attention to everything that we do. Now we can't tie our shoe without the media paying attention. Uh, and the challenging thing about that was, this idea that when there's 10 to 15 employees, you can make a lot of mistakes and there's no real risk, right? Nothing, what's the worst thing that happens? No one actually is paying attention. You live your life thinking that everyone is so obsessed with what goes on in your life and you realize that no one actually gives a shit about you. And once you kind of get comfortable with that feeling, you're able to, to do a lot more. And so uh, that was a big challenge for us, going from 15 employees to 15,000 employees. And, and the big, bigger challenge there was we had to keep learning while we were building this company because we had so many people looking at us internally, more important than anything else, but externally where, you know, the pressures, especially today in, in building a consumer tech company are there, you know, there's plenty of them. Um, and so this idea of learning while leading is something that I've embraced personally. And I, the, the handful of lessons that I'll share over the next 20 or so minutes are, you know, what I consider, you know, my Bible or like my North Star of how I've been able to get through this. And I think, you know, I'll explain them through stories and experiences that I've gone through, but I believe that these lessons are applicable for anybody at any stage in their career, in their life, personally, professionally. Um, so hopefully they're helpful for you guys as well. So you know, I mentioned, obviously, I, I work at GoPuff, and, and hopefully you guys all know what that is because Syracuse is a great market for us. Um, it was our 17th market that we launched. I was here. That was the last time I was here, I think, uh, when we launched the market. There's actually this great photo of a, Syrac a GoPuff car in front of Dinosaur Barbecue, which was, I thought, nice and sentimental for me. Uh, no one at the company understood it. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, so when I joined the company, it was six years ago, right? And like I said, uh, you know, very small, unknown organization. Today, looking back, you're like, oh, wow, you joined this amazing, huge company when it was so early. How lucky, how fortunate, like great timing, right place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't such a no-brainer for me when I, when I joined this company. It wasn't because the company was a relative unknown. It was because I had something that we're all familiar with, which is Nego, right? 
And so my experience was I came to GoPuff after five failed startups. Five. Right? That's the thing that no one likes to talk about. Um, I was only 25, but I started my first company actually here at Whitman in the capstone course. It was this crazy credit card startup that we had. Um, Peter Scott was a professor, and we thought we could solve credit card fraud. I was like 20 years old, 21 at the time. Um, and uh, and uh, from there, it was kind of like a snowball effect, uh, or snowball of, of multiple startups. Each one like moderately success, more successful than the last, but relatively a you know, relative failure compared to anything that you know, we've done since. Um, and ultimately, when I got to meeting our founders at the time, they're 22, I'm 25, and I was at like the lowest point in my professional career. So I had just shut down my fifth company. Three, the, three of the five were mine, two were I was like a first hire. So I just shut down my fifth company. I was my best friend with my co-founder. Uh, I was like $30,000 in credit card debt. My mom is probably streaming right now, who didn't know that, so I'm gonna have to deal with that afterward. <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, and I moved home. I had to put my tail between my legs, moved home for four months. My parents were awesome. They, they welcomed me back. But the, the challenge at the time was I had done all of these things through building companies, but I had no resume. And so when I was like applying for jobs and trying to figure out what I wanted to do, people were basically offering me entry level jobs. And I was like, I, no, I, was, I don't want to do that. I've done all these things. I want to like build. And, and honestly, in the back of my head, I was like, I'm meant to be a founder. I'm, I'm supposed to build a company. That's what I always thought I would do. Um, and there's something, there's this like weird dynamic around the idea of being a founder where you feel this like sense of pride and ownership. And, um, you know, it's, it's ego. It's ego driven, right? You feel cool. Whether the company's good or not or successful, this idea of being a founder had, has been, glor um, you know, uh, memorialized in a way through. Look, Facebook and Twitter and all these companies and the founders are, are held on a pedestal um, and they deserve it. They built these amazing companies, but like it never was sexy to be a founder like 15 years ago. Look at all the companies that have started outside of tech. So anyways, my point is that I was obsessed with this idea of being a founder. And so what was holding me back from joining such a great company that is going on, hopefully, to become a revolutionary company that changes the way that consumers behave for the better, um, what was holding me back was the fact that I wasn't going to be the number one. I was gonna to have to go work for someone else. And those two guys that I was gonna work for were 22. Now they're brilliant, and it's the best thing that I've ever done, uh, but I couldn't get over that. And at that time, I happened to be fortunate enough to stumble upon this book called Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday, which I would highly recommend. I give it to a lot of my employees and, and friends. Um, and basically the book is about, as you can imagine, like checking your ego at the door and the value of being a number two to eventually learn how to become a number one. And he, he writes this book through the stories or the eyes of all of these great individuals over the course of history, um, I mean, the last hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, who were the number two and who supported some organization or individual or family, learned uh, and, and made their mark that way and eventually became great leaders. And he has this phrase, um, it's, a, it's a Greek phrase called antiambulo, and it means he who clears the path. And for whatever reason, reading this book at that time, it resonated with me, and everything just kind of clicked. And I realized I wasn't ready to be a founder yet. And so I ended up taking the job uh, with GoPuff, uh, and it was the best decision that I've ever made. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, you join a company, you start to scale, things are great, you're having a lot of fun. Uh, and then one day you wake up and you realize, I'm this 20-something-year-old executive, uh, now we have hundreds of millions of dollars into the billions of dollars being invested in our company. We have people who have a lot more money and a lot more at stake on this business than myself. And despite the work that I'm doing, uh, it's, it's, I don't have the pedigree. I don't have you know, the gray hair, as I joke. I don't have the experience that a lot of investors and a board want to see uh, in a company that's scaling and trying to do the things that we're doing. And so every day for me was like a fight. Right? I had to make sure that I was always going to have to outperform every single person that sat at the table with me because I had no resume. I used to joke, if you look at all the resumes of our executive team at any point in time, which one of these is not like the other? Right? It was always mine. And, and founders, our founders were young and they're first time founders, but they're founders, which is a totally different dynamic. Uh, and so I thought at the time that the way to continue to scale with the company was to take on more was to keep doing whatever was in front of me or whatever wasn't getting done. 
So I kind of became this like fixer early on in my career, which I loved. And, and at the time I didn't realize it, but what I loved about it was you felt needed, you felt important, and you felt that like the bigger your scope got, the more influence you had, right? Uh, what I didn't realize is how heavy and full my plate was getting as an operator at the company. And because of like, you know, I'm young, I'm immature, I didn't know how to articulate this to our founders, and you, you feel like it would be kind of a sign of weakness to be like, this is too much, I can't do all of these things, so, yep, I'll do this. Yep, I'll do that. And, and I got to this point where I was working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and ultimately wasn't productive. And what I was realizing was I went from this idea of going from room to room, managing this to that, to I would fix one problem and something else would break. And then another thing would break. And I just had too many people reporting to me. I had too wide of a scope. Uh, and it took me a long time. It was, it was years, right? And by the way, this was like an accelerated experience for me. So this is over the course of years and going like very extreme growth that not many companies get to go through. I mean, by all material metrics, GoPuff has become one of the fastest growing tech companies of all time. Um, so it is, it is a bit of a different experience, but I had to understand that fast. And, you know, through a series of like very hard conversations with my founders and getting very direct feedback, which I'm super appreciative of, um, and then another handful of conversations with mentors and advisors that, that I respect and, and admire, what I realized was that what had made me stand out earlier in my career or in the life cycle of the company, which was like being this fixer and being in all of these rooms, wasn't going to get me to the next level. And if I wanted, to, and, and ultimately what I was going through was what, what, most, what happens to most early executives at tech companies because they grow super fast and the average life cycle of like, it's like a, the average life cycle of a tech executive is like a running back in the NFL. It's like two to three years, right? Because there's so much that happens in that kind of growth in such a short period of time. Um, and so I realized that that could be my fate or I had to change the way that I was operating. I had to do something different. And the things that had gotten me there, like I said, which was being in every room, weren't going to get me to the next level. In fact, what was going to get me to the next level was saying no to a lot of these rooms and being comfortable enough to not be in those rooms and not have to... not. Being okay not being at every table and making every decision because in the beginning when there's 10 to 15 employees, of course you have to make every decision. There's, you literally have one room as an office. All of a sudden you've got thousands of employees. You can't possibly, it's not humanly possible. Um, and so that pressure that I was putting on myself was unfair to myself. Um, and ultimately what I learned was, and there's this great article that First Round Capital had put out years ago called Letting Go of Your Legos. And I realized it was time to let go of mine. And so basically over the last, you know, six to 12 months, I've undergone this restructure of my scope and, and my focus. Uh, and ultimately what I realized was by bringing down my scope, I, I did a few things. One, and this is the most important, is I gave the company air cover and room to hire the best possible candidate for every job. In the company. Right? Because ultimately that's great for the company, but I'm a shareholder, right? I should want that too. And if I'm not the best person for a job, I shouldn't be doing the job. And so that's what it enabled for the company. And then for me, what it allowed me to do was figure out what I was actually good at uh, and be really good at it, right? And be a subject matter expert. And then ultimately the benefit of that or like the outcome was I had more capacity. And so with that more capacity, I actually got to take on, now I get to take on new challenges and do new things and help the business go to the next level. Um, and so this idea of letting go of your Legos, I think has been really, really valuable for me, and it's something I encourage a lot of people, both at our company and that I talk to, to focus on, because scope does not equal influence. You know, work product equals influence, and, and making sure you're doing the right things and having the right capacity to do more is super important. And it's not cool to be in meetings 18 hours a day, back to back, and do no work. You need time to think. You need to sleep. You need to be healthy. You need to, you know, focus on the things that, that are best and, and right for the company and best for you to spend your time on. It took me a while. To get to that and, and so that leads me to kind of the last uh, story or lesson and what I think is actually the most important which is everybody's journey is their own and and this one took me a really hard long time to, to learn and, and beyond just being your own ultimately uh, the most new innovative and great things creations or companies that are built are usually done by unqualified people right and and so this idea for years as you can imagine, being a young executive at, at a fast-growing company like this, I looked for, well, who can I model myself after, right? And it started as like, 
how do I, who do I want to be in 10 years? That's who I'm going to go attract myself. Or that's who's going to attract me. That's who I'm going to go spend time with. That's who I'm going to go learn from. Um, and then it became this very like dark, who I'm comparing myself to this person, right? Which was totally unfair to my own like mind because these people I was talking to were 15, 20 years my senior. They had degrees I didn't have. They had experiences I couldn't get from where I was. And it was just like, it was apples and oranges. Um, and then on the flip side, I had all these friends who were starting companies, selling those companies. And I'm sitting here and I'm going, why am I not doing this? Why am I not doing that? Um, you know, I have accomplished nothing compared to this person. And like, I'm sure a lot of people have gone through something similar, but that's like a dark place to be. Uh, and then, you know, I, again, I sought out more mentors. I sought out advisors and I tried to understand why, why I was thinking that way. Um, and ultimately, what I realized was I'm doing this. But then for every person I'm looking at and comparing myself to and I'm saying, why have I not accomplished this? There's a person looking at me doing the same thing, right? Which is, it's terrible that like as human beings, that's how our minds work, but it's true. Uh, and once I understood that, you know, and I joked in the beginning, but once you understand that no one gives a shit about you, you can do anything. You can accomplish anything because you realize that like, and I don't mean that in like a, you know, a degrading way. I mean that in like a freeing way, right? Because you realize that you can make mistakes, you can do things wrong, and ultimately you're going to wake up the next day and everything's going to be the same. Good, bad, or ugly. Uh, and so I stopped comparing myself to the likes of like the Emil Michaels and the Adam Baines of the world and realized that like I was building something and I was on this journey that I couldn't compare to anyone else's and that people were going to compare to me and that my hope is that they don't. Because I think the most important thing you have to know in anything that you do, career, building a company, having a family, having personal relationships, is that like everything you go through is unique to you. And you can learn from other experiences. You can talk to other people uh, and hopefully learn from the mistakes, which is what we try to do and save time. Um, but like no one knows the seat that you sit in. And the advice you always have to take with a grain of salt. Because ultimately, uh, it's your life. It's your journey. Um, and that's what makes it so great and so fun. And once you embrace that, you know, you have this level of power you unlock that, that I didn't have before. And so this idea of your journey being it's your own uh, has been really, really important to me. Mm. And so, look, when I think about how I, like, wrap all this together, a lot of it is root rooted in the idea of, like, being mentally tough and understanding the way that your mind works, right? removing your ego or leaving your ego at the door is something we always say to employees when, when they join. Letting go of your Legos is, is key. It's important as you scale in anything that you do. Uh, and the idea that embracing your own journey as its own, I mean, these are all themes for me that I've learned while leading a company uh, and while scaling a company, right? Um, and, and to me, this untraditional journey, this untraditional path is the only reason I was able to learn these things. And a story that I didn't start with that I'll end with is not only did I not only almost almost not get into Syracuse, I also almost didn't get into Whitman. And uh, you would think that after, you know, kind of screwing off in high school and, and my mom having to apply to college for me and somehow by the skin of my teeth getting into Syracuse, that I would have learned a lesson or two, right? And that I would have come to Syracuse with my head on straight. I would start doing, going to class. I mean, in high school, I had missed more classes than I attended. Um, and you would think that I would come here with a different like perspective. I didn't. <laughs> I spent the first two years of Syracuse uh, at Syracuse basically doing everything you can imagine other than coming to school class. Um, and I will leave that up to interpretation of what those things were. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I, I had exposure to entrepreneurship my whole life. I was very fortunate. Um, product of environment is something I believe in. And, and all, basically everyone in my family. Uh, my dad's father had his own pharmacy. My mother's father had his own medical practice. Uh, my uncle has his own consulting firm. My dad has his own law firm. My mom had her own woman's boutique. So, I, I, you know, from a young age, I, I saw what entrepreneurship looked like and how hard it was to build something from scratch. And even in high school, the one thing that I actually did was I, I did this, like, uh, what was it called? It was, like, basically, like, a capstone class uh, where I built a business plan and went to like the national competition. So the only thing like materially impressive that I did in high school academically was around building a business. 
Um, but the first year and a half at Syracuse, I, I didn't know anything about Whitman. Um, I joked with Allison, like, I didn't really even know what Whitman Day was until she called me. Um, and uh, I mean that, you know, with all the respect to, to Mr. Whitman. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when you think about that, I came to the school, I was studying kinesiology. I was like, oh, I'm an athlete. I'll become a physical therapist. Uh, and what I didn't realize was how much science went into <laughs> being a trainer. <laughs> so I'm not big on biology or anything like that. So I was very quickly out. Uh, and, and anyways, I got exposed a little bit to Whitman through some friends. And what I learned was that, and this was, you know, more than a decade ago, that Whitman had this thing called entrepreneurship. It was a program, and we were number three or two in the country at the time. We were, Whitman was far ahead, uh, of, or Syracuse was far ahead of, of the rest of the colleges and universities with this program. And I was like, wait a second, I can study building a company? I was like, that's pretty cool. I was like, maybe I'll do that. So I looked into um, what it would take to transfer to Whitman. Um, so I'm like, it was, I think it was the back half of my sophomore year. I went through the process, and there was this like one line that said, you know, minimum 3.3 GPA required to, to transfer to Whitman. So I was like, what's my GPA? I didn't know what my GPA was, so that tells you everything you need to know. I look it up, uh, it was like a 2.6, 2.7. I was like, okay. I was like, maybe, um, maybe this is like loose direction <laughs> and not a hard rule, a hard and fast rule. I was like, I'll apply. We'll see what happens. So I applied, and I don't think you'll be surprised to hear this. I was surprised to hear this. I got rejected. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know, maybe it's more than a loose direction. Maybe I need to get my grades up. So like, I'll work really hard this next semester. I'll get a 3-3. Obviously, I didn't understand how weighted GPAs worked. Um, and, and then I'll apply again. So I worked, I worked my ass off, and I look at my GPA, and I'm like, okay, now my blended GPA is like a 2-8, 2-9 maybe. So I'm like, you know what? They'll see the persistence. I'll apply again. They'll let me in. I was like, it's going to work out. I, I have this tendency to think that things just eventually work out. Um, and so I applied again. Now, it was the beginning of my junior year, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Like, if you don't get in mid-junior year, like, you're done. There's no more business school. So I applied. I got rejected <laughs> again. Um, so now I'm like, shit. What, what am I going to do? My life is ruined. I've decided I want to go into business, but I'm never going to get into the business school. So, like, should I just drop out? Like, what do I do? You know, I'm screwed. Uh, and I was like, you know what? Um, there's got to be a third door. There's got to be another way to get into the business school. So I sat down. I wrote a letter. So I said, I, had to, I have to stand off the, off, the page, off the page. I can't just be a bunch of numbers that, that someone's looking at, because obviously my numbers are terrible, uh, and I'm not going to get in. So I, I sat down and I penned this letter to the head of intra university admissions, who I cannot recall her name. Um, and I pleaded my case. I said, look, there's more to the story than the numbers. I, I explained how I felt I was important and I would do all of these great things. Um, and that I promised that if Whitman took a chance on me and let me into the university or the school, that I would make them proud. So I sent the letter. A couple weeks go by, I get a letter back. I got it. So, you know, again, it's incredibly humbling to be standing here and having this conversation as someone who barely got into the university, who barely got into uh, to Whitman, and who's been fortunate enough to go on and build and, and hopefully continue to scale such a great and large company. Um, but, like, if I'm going to wrap it up for everybody, the real thing is there's no silver bullet, right? There's no get-rich-quick scheme. There's no, like... Here's the playbook for success. No, you know, and anyone who tells you, like, here's how you do things is full of shit. Because there's so many different paths that you can take. And like I said, your journey is yours. But the only things that are true or fundamentally true that I've realized in all the successful people that I've met and in my own life is you have to work your ass off. You have to know what you want. You have to be comfortable with yourself and your journey. And you got to get a little bit lucky along the way. You know? So thanks for listening to me. I really appreciate you all taking time out of your day to tune in. Thanks to, to the Dean and, and Allison and, and Syracuse for, for having me speak. I think we're doing questions.
Dan, it looks like we got one uh, from our from our Zoom audience somewhere in the world. Sure. Um, were there classes you took that stood out as being helpful to what you're doing now? Which classes do you wish you had more time to focus on while you were here? It's a great Maybe a tinge of regret in there. I, I don't yeah. know. Just let, you know. It's a great question. The faculty may not love this answer. Um, I was talking to the dean last night about this. I uh, the things that I learned at Syracuse were how to build relationships, were how to network. You how to live on your own. I learned how to open a can of tuna. Um, I learned how to do my own. I swear, I called my mom a week into college. I said, how do I open this can of tuna? Um, so survival skills. Survival ben, skills. Ben, ben, ba ben, basic ben. human skills yeah, is what I learned in college. Um, uh, no, but all seriousness, I didn't really go to a lot of class in, in college. I'm not suggesting that's what people should do. Um, but, but here's always been my problem. Uh, I think the academic approach to a lot of different practices professionally leaves a lot to be desired. And so what you learn, what I learned in college and some of the courses I enjoyed the most were the entrepreneurship courses because there was a lot more practicality to them. They weren't just theoretical. Um, I joke about the net present value thing, but I'm serious. You know, I, I run, you know, I lead our M&A practice at, at GoPuff and we've acquired eight companies. We've raised $4 billion. Uh, and like I have spent zero time in banking or finance or anything of the sort. That doesn't make me great. What, what I'm saying there is you learn by doing. Uh, and so what I'd love to see, and I've had this conversation with folks, is how do we bring more practical education to secondary education? Because I think giving students more experience, that's why Capstone is fantastic. Because even though you're not actually starting the business, you build a business plan like you're starting the business. And so I have to say like the entrepreneurship programs were, were probably um, the best, um, you know, but that's my experience. I don't want to cut anyone off, but we've got another one uh, online. When you evaluate partners for GoPub, what do you look for? Valuable insight for others looking to start their own ventures. Yeah, it's a, another great question. Um, I mean, I think we have so many different partners in so many different areas. Um, we're looking for brands that resonate with our consumers. Um, so I'm assuming that question is related to like products that we sell, um, you know, businesses that we think are going to be successful long term, and that have some sort of appeal or audience that they can bring to our platform. So, you know, combination of these things. Another one. What skill are you most focused on improving right now, profession? I don't think I'm good at much. Um, so there's a lot that I can get better at. Um, but one thing that I spend a lot of time on is people management, because I think it's really hard. Uh, and naturally, I'm not great at it, because I'm so focused on building and doing my own thing that I lose sight of the 200 people that report to me uh, and how important you know every day is for them. And so that's something that I'm spending a lot of time on and getting a lot of mentorship for. OK, here's one. Um... <laughs> How do you figure out which Legos to let go of? I'll, I'll let you know when I figure that out. <laughs> I'm just making sure I, I don't want to cut anybody off. As a new grad just starting a position, what advice will you give for better internal communication? I think one of the hardest skills for any employee is the ability to manage up. Um, and I think the people who do it sometimes do it too much. So that balance of doing your work across functional communication, but making sure that the people who you report to are ultimately the leaders of the company, know what's going on in your respective field, in your respective day to day, is really important. Especially today in this like virtual world, um, because it used to be that FaceTime would, would help people kind of climb the ladder. Um, that doesn't really exist anymore. So making sure that the work product is great and that that work product is shared effectively is really, really important for the new employee. Kind of, again, a present moment question. What, what's keeping you up at night from a work perspective? I don't sleep much. Um, I think for, from work, for work, the thing that keeps me up at night is, look, we're very fortunate that we've built a business that works really well. 
it's scaled very fast. We've got, like I said, millions of customers, and, and we're operating in thousands of cities across multiple countries. We have a long road ahead of us. We still think this is the beginning. Um, but the thing that keeps us from where we are today to being ultimately in the same conversation as the Airbnbs and you know the, the Teslas of the world and Apple, et cetera, is execution. You know, when you have all of the pieces in place or you have the right recipe, it's can you put it all together and actually execute. So I'd say that's what keeps me up. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. You don't have to catch me off Celtics. Part. I don't know. There's other questions in here, but. Um. <laughs> Um, maybe talk, maybe just a, a little bit deeper on GoPuff. The question comes in and says, "What's your best-selling product at GoPuff, and what keeps? What do you? What would you say right now? It's keeping the business afloat." Future. Yeah, I feel like there's media on this call. Um. <laughs> I mean, it's a person named Anonymous, uh, so you, you know, could, I, could be. I think I know them. Okay. Um, <laughs> taking a quick step back, uh, for those who don't know. GoPuff is an instant delivery company. We sell everything from snacks, ice cream, and alcohol to baby pet beauty products. We deliver it 20 minutes, flat delivery fee, 24 hours a day. We do that differently than most delivery services that you're aware of in the fact that we own inventory and we operate our own micro fulfillment centers. So there are like eight to 12,000 square feet fulfillment centers. We've got 700 of them across the US, the UK, France, and Spain. Um, all, of our, all of the folks in our warehouses or fulfillment centers are W2 employees. And then we have a network of delivery partners who actually do the fulfillment. We control that end-to-end -end customer experience. So giving that background, the, the key difference between our business and all of these third party, as we call it, delivery services, is we make our money on the products that we sell, not the people who deliver them, right? And so our business for the first three years was actually cash flow positive before we raised any money because it had to work. Our founders are, are sons of immigrants. They're first generation Americans and, and they actually built they grew up in their family businesses. So the value of the dollar was super important. Customer experience control was super important. And ultimately, at 20 years old, they had never seen anything like venture capital or private equity. So they had to build a business that made money. Um, that's what keeps us afloat today. We're very well capitalized from an investment perspective. But ultimately, we generate real cash flow on every order that we deliver. That's something that no one else is doing in delivery. Um, that's the, the vertical integration and the structural components of the business are what makes us superior in, in the delivery space and why we think long term that, that this business is ultimately going to work. So Fernando, please. Sure. Hang on. I have not, no. Okay, so he, she, she basically says that there's the three factors that explain success in all three, right? And uh, I'm thinking about two. Please. So, one is you have to have the, there's no doubt that you have to. Right? <laughs> and the other one is that you have to feel a sense of inferiority. And yeah, the imposter you said is that you, you know, you've been saying, you know, I'm not good at this, I'm not good at that. Uh, do you think that's what made you successful, that, you know, that sense of inferiority is you that made you go forward and achieve what you want to achieve? Well, before I answer that, what's the third one? The third one is grit, is never giving up. Well, I'm from I, Philly. You probably so. have too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, it seems to me that you're a typical case that you took back. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it, it's the first two, the combination of the first two is like, to me, imposter syndrome, um, which is this idea that, you know, great, really successful people operate at like 70 to 80% confidence at all times, right? Because that 20 to 30% is doubt. It's fear that you're going to be exposed. That at any given point, the curtain's going to get pulled back and someone's going to go, how's that guy there? That's not right. He shouldn't be there. Let's get him out of there, right? Uh, it's something I've dealt with my whole life. Um, I think that's a big component. I, like, I joke about the Philly thing, but I, you know, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. So I saw what it looks like. I saw what it, I didn't know any other way. Um, so yeah, I'd have to say it's probably a combination of those three things that has helped me be successful. Okay, unless there's another one from the room. I think we've got one more. Let's um, do it. And I appreciate your time doing this, Dan. Um, you talked a little bit about your your path, obviously, and your path to GoPuff. 
I'm just wondering if we could uh, if you could elaborate a little bit, thinking about whether it's an undergraduate or a young alum who's looking to join a firm, a concern. You talked about the infectiousness of the founders, and that was attractive to you. Can you just talk a little bit about your decision to join, looking back at, you know, maybe a little bit longer onto the list about why you felt like making that move to go pup was, was right for you? Understanding it's all worked out great, clearly. <laughs> That's which is awesome, but a lot of young people are like, "Hey, I don't know what the future's going to hold. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. Which door do I pick?" I wondered if you could just maybe characterize your decision about go, go up a little more. Yeah, look, I think I've developed a framework for making decisions like this that I try to share with people who are younger. I got the best advice I ever got. I was like in my twenties, going through this whole everything I just talked about and trying to decide what I want to do. And it was my uncle, who I'm super close with, and he's one of my closest mentors. And he said to me, "He's like, look." Uh, your 20s and 30s are not about making money. Your 20s and 30s are about building great relationships, doing great work, and setting yourself up for the future. Setting yourself up for the future. Like any money you make in your 20s and 30s is crazy. Take it, but, but don't expect it. Um, and I say that to say that I've used that in how I make decisions for where I would, or how I made that decision, how I think people should when they think about their career, which is A, you know, do you believe in the person you're going to work? Not just the founder, because I think you know it's unrealistic to think that everyone can get access to a CEO or a founder, depending on the size of the company. But do you believe in the person that you're going to work with? Because ultimately, that manager, you want to be so good that wherever they go, you want to follow them. And you want to be so good that wherever they go, they bring them. And that's kind of how you see careers be built. So I think that's one thing. The second thing is, can't, do you love the problem you're solving and the work that you're doing? Because if you don't, don't do it. Because you'll never be good. It will always be a nine to five, and you'll be living for the weekend forever. Um, the third is, if those two are true, are you going to do great work? Can you do great work? Can you build a work product that you can be proud of? That when you go to look to do something else or grow in that company, um, that ultimately you can point to and say, "I did this. This was great." And then the last thing is, like, do you like the people that you work with? Because if you don't, don't take the job. It'll be a miserable existence. And so those four things is really how I would look at, you know, choosing choosing a role at any age, by the way, at any skill set. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. I think, I think that's it. I think we're good. We got there. Thank you so much, Dan. Really appreciate it. Thank you.